Good morning. The lesson from the Old Testament for this morning is found in Jeremiah 5, verses 20 through 31, found on page 546 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and scentless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. <clears throat> they do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have deprived you of good. For scoundrels are found among my people. They take over the goods of others. Like fowlers, they set a trap. They catch human beings. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of treachery. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no limits in deeds of wickedness. They do not judge with justice the cause of the orphan to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not bring retribution on a nation such as this? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule as the prophets direct. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Mark 8, verse 14 through 21, found in page 33 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They said to one another, It is because we have no bread. And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, seven. Then he said to them, do you not yet understand? The word of God for the people of God. Thank you pray with me. Gracious God, be patient. For Lord, sometimes we are slow, oftentimes we are slow. Slow to understand, and we need your grace. We need your spirit to illumine our, our eyes, to open our hearts, to help us to understand. And during this passage, we need help to understand, and we ask that your spirit would be present among us now to help us so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As an English teacher, I loved, well, I, I love all literature, but I love teaching Chaucer. Chaucer is a lot of fun, and I'm sorry if you're asleep already. You heard Chaucer and just... I get really excited about things like Chaucer and Shakespeare because I find the literature interesting. And, and I, this may come as a shock, but when you teach Chaucer to a bunch of seniors in high school, they're not quite as enthusiastic about it as I am. 
I, I know that that might be a little bit of a shock, but one of my favorite tales in the Canterbury Tales, uh, Chaucer's uh, most famous work, is in the general prologue. It's, it's in, the, in the introduction that Chaucer gives to the entire thing, and it's of the cook. And the cook has this little five-line introduction, and we find out about the cook that he can cook all sorts of things. He can make all sorts of dishes. And when you read through the description, okay, he can make this, and he can make, he can make chicken, and, and, and all sorts of bird, and, and, and pies. And then Chaucer pivots for just a second, and he says, but he's got this awful ulcer on his knee. But he can make a great cream pudding. Now, some, this is the exact uh, response that you get in the classroom. Some people are going, oh, and some people are going, I don't, why are we putting those two together? And after explaining to students in my class that it's not like today where you have a, 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 a stove and you're cooking on the stove top like this, most likely it was a pot on the ground with a fire, and the cook with his knee is cooking right there, that some of them start to get it. And yet at this point, despite the wonderful pedagogical display that I can put on, there are some students who still just don't get it. And you want to say, don't you get it? It's funny. And some students are saying, no, it's disgusting. And other students are still just saying, what? Don't you, the also, the, no, oh, okay. You say, don't you get it? That despite how many times you go through the text and you work through it step by step, to me it's hilarious. It's great that someone in 1300 would write that. That's amazing. But some people just don't get it. Or some people do get it and they look at me and say, you're just kind of strange. And that may be true. But that's a little bit of where we are today with the disciples. In this story, we've been going through Mark, and, and the disciples have seen some amazing things. The, the disciples just got done seeing for the second time Jesus feeding a large number of people. He was in the, in the Decapolis. He was in Gentile territory. And for the second time here, he's fed a large crowd. He fed the 4,000 with seven loaves of bread loaves of bread. And they've seen this, and, and he, it, it must have been utterly astounding. We like to think that if we would see a sign like that, that that would be pretty obvious, uh, that something special is going on, that, that this is someone of note. But he crosses, at, at the end of this, at the end of the feeding, he sends the crowds away, they're, they're satisfied, and he crosses over the Sea of Galilee. We're still in that Sea of Galilee region, north of Jerusalem. He's gone. He's taken a trip. He's gone from the Sea of Galilee, which is kind of in the middle and the bottom there. He's gone up along that orange path. He's gone to Tyre. He's gone to Sidon. He's come back down through where that red is to the southeast portion of the Sea of Galilee. And he crosses over to the west. And there he encounters the Pharisees. And the Pharisees demand a sign from him. If you remember from last week, they want some sort of validation that what he's doing is from heaven. They want that seal of approval from God. Because what he's doing so far, that's pretty miraculous, it's pretty impressive, but we're just not sure where it's coming from. So they say, we want some sort of sign. And he gives that groan and says, why, why are you asking for a sign? Really? You haven't seen it yet? You need more? And he says, I, I tell you the truth. You're looking for a sign, but no sign is going to be given to you. So don't even try. 
And at that point, they leave that region called Dalmanutha. It's a great name that I have to say. Jerry did a fantastic job rolling right through yet, uh, last week. But it, they leave this region of Dalmanutha, and they cross the Sea of Galilee again. And it's at this point that the disciples have ta- forgotten to take bread with them. They forgot to take a snack with them. This is a little bit like going to the grocery store and for, to pick up dinner and leaving with everything but dinner. And I'm sure that, that I am probably the only one who has ever done that. But it's like that, going in and you, you get this and oh, I need that and, and you just fed 4,000. You had seven basketfuls left over and somehow they forget to take bread with them and it says except for one loaf that they had. Now this isn't like a loaf of bread when you go to hy V and you pick it up and you pay $2.99 and you say, okay, I have a loaf of bread. This is more like an individual pita size when it says a loaf of bread. So if you can imagine 12 disciples at least plus Jesus, this is not good math for one slice of pita. And so they are probably quite conscious of the fact that that they have forgotten to take bread and the fact that they had quite a bit there to pick from. And it's in this context that Jesus gives them a warning. He says, beware. Be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And in that sense, in that context, it's a bit understandable why the disciples are confused. They have just gotten done forgetting the thing they had in the greatest abundance since the last feeding story. And they, they're a bit sensitive to the fact that they forgot bread. He's criticizing us because we forgot bread. I realize it's an obvious mistake We get it, Jesus. You don't need to to rub it in. And it causes a bit of a discussion or an argument amongst the disciples. Because as you can imagine, with 12 disciples there, the argument that's ensuing that, well, wasn't it your job? No. No, I was taking care of this. It's bad enough when Katie and I forget something at the store. Well, you said you were going to pick it up. Well, I thought you were going to to have that dispersed amongst 12 people gets a little bit tense. And they're thinking about this immediate context and they're feeling criticized. And what they fail to realize and remember is that leaven isn't always just a reference to bread. In their language, leaven had a double meaning. It had a metaphorical meaning, a symbolic meaning. It could mean corruption. It could mean sinfulness. And it seems that this is the meaning that in their context, having forgotten food and probably feeling a little hungry and a little criticized, that they're forgetting. Corruption and sinfulness. And it's while this argument discussion is going on, Jesus becomes aware of their conversation he starts to give them a bit of a wake-up call. A bit of that comment, don't you get it? It's like a teacher going step by step through a, a story or a problem. Like me running through bit by bit that introduction of the cook in the Canterbury Tales. This and this and this to try to get the light bulb to go on, to appreciate, to see what's right in front of us, what's right in front of them. And Jesus begins his wake-up call for the disciples. He says to them, why are you reasoning it? Why are you reasoning? Why are you discussing? Why are you arguing? That's because you have no bread. 
that I'm talking to you. Have you not yet perceived or understood what's going on here? Or have your hearts been hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Or don't you want remember? He asked them questions in which he actually references the Old Testament. He references Jeremiah, and that in of itself becomes a little bit of a sign. Where Jeremiah says, declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Don't you tremble before me? I place the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it can't pass. The waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they can't pass over it. Jesus is, is trying to get them to, to see, can't you see through all the wonders that I've done? Through the feedings, through the miracles, through the exorcisms, through healings, who I am. Don't you get it? Don't you remember these things? He recounts his acts of care and compassion. He starts to go through the feeding stories with them over and over again, asking them questions. Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves? How many basketfuls did you pick up? And they remember, they... 12. And don't you remember when I broke the seven loaves not too long ago? How many basketfuls there did you pick up? Seven. Don't you get it? Don't you see? Again, it seems to be referencing Jeremiah. Jeremiah says an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their discretion. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? The Pharisees have just shut themselves off to Jesus. I think part of the reason why Jesus says that a sign isn't going to be given to them, to, to go back to last week for just a second, is because he knows where they are in their hearts. They, he knows that they are closed off. He could give them a neon sign and they still wouldn't listen. He could give them a, a, a sign the size of Las Vegas and they still wouldn't acknowledge where it came from. Here though, he's asking the disciples, what about you? Are you going to keep your eyes closed? You've been with me the entire time. Now, I'll say, we're, we're tempted, in a sense, to look at this the way that Jesus puts it. Do you still not understand? And we look at that as the proverbial slap upside the back of the head. Don't you get it? Because he's, in some ways, the evidence is in front of them plainly. They were the ones who were there. They distributed the bread. They saw him heal people. And we like to think we would be able to get it. But sometimes the evidence, sometimes things are in front of us plainly and we don't see it, do we? We had a, a wedding here recently. Heather Norse uh, got married in the sanctuary recently. And uh, I was working with Dale. We were working on polishing some brass. And uh, Dale, if you don't know, he's like the Swiss Army knife of the church. Um, <laughs> And so we were talking about things, and Dale knows a lot of history, and points out to me something that I had never noticed before. If you look at our candelabra, when they're, if they're out, if you look at the cross, we have signs of the Trinity on the very elements around architecture around our sanctuary. Pointed out to me that there are three steps on the base of the cross and on the base of the candelabra. They're Trinitarian. I went, mercy, I've never noticed that. 32 years in the church and I've never noticed it. 
Now if you can see it, you might be looking going, oh yeah, there are three there, aren't there? It's a sign that sat in front of us for how many years and maybe some of us got it and maybe some of us didn't see it. Similarly, there are symbols inside our very Presbyterian cross. The cross that's here week in and week out. The sign of the dove, the Holy Spirit, the fire for, the, for Pentecost, the chalice, the lectern with the, with the Bible on top. Signs of our faith all melded into one symbol. We look at it and sometimes we just don't see it. Or as I brought up last week, in a perhaps a bit more understandable fashion, like those pesky I spy books that take three years to find 11 canons. But there are symbols in front of us and we don't always see it, do we? And so we can understand how even with something very blatant, the disciples might not see it. But like I said, we're tempted to think that this is Jesus kind of taking a backhand up their head. Except for there's one little word. He says, yet. Don't you yet understand? Don't you yet get it? Don't you yet see? And in that little word, we get some brief hope that the disciples will indeed get it at some point. That at some point they're going to understand, but it's, it's going to take a while for that to happen, for the yet to kick in. At the moment they still seem to have dull eyes and ears. So how do we take this story, how do we take this part of Mark and learn from the disciples' experience of not understanding, of having to be asked, don't you yet get this? I think there's, there's quite a bit here because let's face it, faith can be very, very hard at times. Faith can be difficult because we don't understand everything and it rests on, well, faith. We like things that are laid out for us. We like things that are easily digestible. We like things that are easily understandable. That's why we like CSI and NCIS. That's why we like sitcoms. Because in 30 or 60 minutes we can see a problem, have it solved, and feel good. Unless, of course, those fateful three words are there, to be continued. In which case, we have one week of frustration. Unless it's a season finale, and then we're really mad. But faith is hard. We like things wrapped up quickly. We like things that we can digest easily. And that's also why we can find Scripture to be so difficult. Because it takes more than 30 or 60 minutes sometimes. For some of us who have been around the church much longer, I'm sure that uh, we can say that it takes sometimes 30, 50, 60 years to get some aspects of the faith, and even then, it's hard to understand. And Scripture can be difficult because not all of it wraps up neatly. I had a comment after one of the stories where Jesus doesn't give an ending. Someone commented to me, I don't like stories that don't wrap up nicely, where the ending isn't given. And then there are those cultural references and allegories that need a fair amount of concentration to entangle, or a pastor waning on for 30 minutes and, stru and you struggling to stay awake through it. The scripture can be hard and, and, and it takes perseverance. But let's face it, it's not just faith that's difficult, is it? There's, there's a lot in our world that requires some difficult and hard thought. When we're faced with questions like how do we educate and strengthen our younger generations? 
How do we best take care of our older generations? How best do we spend our time? What's the right thing to do in just about anything? What happens when I'm faced with a problem at work and there seems to be no good answer? What is God calling me to do in life? And how do we spend our limited resources? Our very checkbook can present conundrums that don't wrap up in 30 or 60 minutes. You know, I, in seminary, I spent almost all of my electives in ethics. Difficult and messy situations in life. What happens when things don't go as planned? What happens when life gets difficult, when tough choices are there? The messy stuff of life. We have to face this all the time in different situations. One of the interesting things out of my ethics class that, that made me realize how difficult life can be is when we went over reproductive ethics and it's, uh, you think, well, why do I need to know that as a pastor? And then the professor brought up the statistic that one in eight, roughly, couples suffers with infertility. And you go, now that's statistically significant to my ministry. Six classes in ethics, and certainly I didn't get everything figured out. And yet, despite the hard work, some, despite the times that I could figure some things out and come to a decision and an understanding of Scripture that sat at least decently well, uh, sat at least decently well with me, sometimes the answer just wasn't and isn't apparent, is it? We get into the messy things of life and we're not quite sure what to do and we're not quite sure where God wants us to go. The question is, in this story for today, for today, how are we going to respond when we hit those blind spots? How are we going to respond when the messy things happen? When we're not sure of the path forward, where we don't know what's going to happen, when we don't know if the checkbook's going to balance or if the situation in family or work is going to work out. The disciples had a major blind spot. It was who Jesus was. Do you understand who I am? And at that moment, all they could say is, yeah, you're the guy that's criticizing us for not bringing bread. Don't you see? I'm so much more than that. But Jesus didn't give up on them, did he? Despite the fact that he's sounding a little harsh, do you not understand? He added that word. Yet? You might not get it yet, but I'm going to keep after you. I'm going to keep working on you and keep being there with you. He doesn't give up on the disciples despite the harsh words. He wants them and he wants us to keep going. Sometimes the signs are in front of us the entire time. We just need to see it, whether it's noticing that every base around here has three steps to it. Even the flower bases, I would point out, have three steps to it. It gets a little disconcerting after you, a while when you start looking around going, mercy, how many things have three steps to it in this sanctuary that I never noticed? Sometimes the signs are right in front of us and we just need a little help to see it. I just needed Dale to point it out and I was able to see it in the architecture. We need someone to come alongside of us and spell it out like a teacher explaining Chaucer. Someone who's very absurdly enthusiastic about Chaucer or about God and the way that he works in our lives. 
to come alongside of us and spell us out. We need someone to mentor and disciple us, to tell us how we see God moving in our lives. We need not just biological mothers as we celebrate them today, but we need spiritual mothers too. Spiritual mothers who come and say, this is what God is doing in your life. Don't you see it? And spiritual fathers and brothers and sisters too. We need to, people to remind us of how God is working in and around us and what God wants to accomplish in and around and through us. So let me ask you this. Have you seen God working in your life or in someone else's life and felt the Spirit prompting you to mentor them? Have you seen God at work in someone's life and felt, I need to let them know how God is working? Are you being used to help open someone else's eyes? How will you respond? Next week, as, as I mentioned, uh, not just Pentecost Sunday, but we will be having the sacrament of baptism and the reception of new members. People that we are welcoming into this particular family of faith. Gathered at 18th and 24th and called Good Shepherd. The question that we have as a congregation is what are we going to do? Will we simply say welcome and leave it at that? Or will we look into their lives and come alongside and say, say, I see God working in your life. Have you seen it? Do you see the way that God wants to use you and the gifts that God has given you? Do you get it? What are we going to do when we welcome those new members? It's a, it's a very special moment, particularly in baptism. Because I don't just ask questions of those receiving baptism or the parents of those re receiving baptism, but I ask questions of the congregation as well. Because we are called to come alongside, to do the work of God, to see the work of God in each other and to spur each other on. Jesus wanted to encourage the disciples through his questions. Do you see these things? Do you get it? Do you know what God wants to do in your life? Jesus was warning his disciples against spiritual blindness and deafness that the Pharisees and, and Herod demonstrated so far in Mark. And he wanted to encourage them to see signs of who he is and what the kingdom is like. Do you feel blind at times? Who are the sp spiritual mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers that you have to come alongside to help you seek God's work and action in your life? And do you see it in others? And do you encourage them with those words? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your church, for reminding us why you have assembled us and appointed us to be here. Work in and through and amongst us despite our faults and our failings, for we're imperfect. Nudge us along when we need our eyes opened. And seal this word in our hearts so that we can remember that you persist after us. Even when we feel like we have not understood for the fifth or hundredth or thousandth time. Help us to remember your persistence, your love. And help us to see your work in each other. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.